Hi, this is Podcast 8. In this podcast, we're going to talk about transport across uh, membranes and mechanisms for that. This is a lot of how cells work, is moving something across a membrane. And most of the data from which these principles come from comes from studying human red blood cells, simply because they're easy to collect, they can be collected non-destructively, uh, meaning that you don't kill the person. But they're certainly not the only kind of membranes out there. They're also weird cells because when they're mature, they don't have a nucleus. Not all red blood cells um, lose their nucleus when they're mature, but humans, when humans do. Um, for example, camelids, camels, uh, still have a nucleated red blood cell. But um, that's just to let you know that you know there are, there's bias in all kinds of science in terms of these cells are easy to study, so most of what we know is from these cells. Later on in the course, we'll talk about these uh, HeLa cells where we have a lot of our knowledge from cancer biology comes from studying these cells because they're relatively easy to grow inside of a lab but they're also super weird cells. Okay, uh, just looking at a table here talking about the different kinds of transport across membranes. You can have simple diffusion. So something is high on one con high concentration on one side of the membrane, low concentration on the other side of the membrane. It's just going through the membrane. It's not going through a specific uh, pore. Um, uh, not through, it's not regulated transport, and there's no protein involved. In facilitated trans, um, facilitated diffusion, there is a protein transporter involved, and it relies on a chemical gradient. So it's like simple diffusion, except for it's simple diffusion through a specific pore, but it still relies on high to low concentration gradient. And then there's active transport, which relies on pumps, really relies on ATP. And uh, in active transport, things are going against their concentration gradient, so from low to high instead of high to low. Um, in simple diffusion, uh, you can have things cross the membrane. Uh, so, so for example, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water can diffuse across the membrane without a transporter, but water is a special case. We're going to talk about that. Uh, water is greatly facilitated by uh, movement through a protein, uh, but CO2 and, uh, and oxygen move across the uh, red blood cell membrane just uh, according to concentration gradients. In facilitated diffusion, you have a specific protein that is embedded in the cell membrane. That protein has a binding site for a particular molecule, and that particular molecule will move into or out of the cell through that protein. Uh, an example is a glucose transporter. GLUT1 is the name of this gene. There are at least 13 different kinds of glucose transporters that are expressed. Uh, it, different uh, tissues in the body and have different functions, um, but uh, glucose will move high to low. Um, if it's higher outside the red blood cell than inside the red blood cell, then it moves in, and the opposite is true. If it's higher inside than outside, it'll move out. You can also have um, facilitated transporter where you move two things at once. So, for example, bicarbonate ions can move out at the same time that chloride ions move in. That balances charge, so you have a negative coming in at the same time a negative is coming out. It's like uh, there was no charge difference. Um, and uh, so it doesn't have to be just one thing at a time. One characteristic of facilitated diffusion is this shape of a curve. So if you look at the rate of diffusion on the y-axis and the concentration of what is moving on the x-axis, 
if you're talking about simple diffusion, uh, the concentration is directly, concentration difference, uh, delta S, sorry, concentration difference, the gradient. Concentration difference is um, directly proportional to how fast things move. So if you have a big concentration gradient, things move faster. If you have a small concentration gradient, things move slower. Um, that's uh, hopefully intuitive. But in facilitated diffusion, it looks different in that usually the concentration rate or the, the rate of diffusion of the material will move in a linear fashion on the, the low end of the concentration gradient. And then the high end of the concentration gradient, it'll asymptote off. And this is because once you saturate all the binding sites for a particular channel, a pore that is going to transport glucose or something like that, then you can't go any faster because that's the rate limiting step. It has to go through that channel. Once all the channels are occupied, then you can't go any faster than that. Below the concentration where all the channel sites are occupied, then more uh, glucose would mean faster transport in this part of the curve. But once you start occupying all those uh, channels, it'll flatten off. And so if you don't know what you're looking at as a physiologist and you're measuring the rate of diffusion across a membrane, just the shape of the curve can tell you whether or not you're looking at simple diffusion versus facilitated diffusion. Um, one of my favorite examples of facilitated diffusion is glucose transport in wood frogs. So this is not a dead frog. This is a frozen wood frog. And they have a mechanism to massively upregulate glucose transporters as soon as their toes or extremities start to feel uh, cold temperatures. So they massively upregulate these glucose transporters. They pump lots of, con of glucose, or, I'm sorry, not pump, but move lots of glucose uh, into their cells and that acts like a cryoprotectant. So just like if you try to make a popsicle at home when you're a kid in an ice cube tray uh, and you have a very sugary solution of Kool-Aid, or orange juice, or whatever, it takes a long time to freeze. Uh, and it's because um, you can lower the freezing point uh, depression by adding sugar to the water. Same thing happens to the frog in that it'll fr the organs will freeze at a lower temperature. And then also, like with your popsicle, it'll also melt at a higher temperature. So the the, what happens is the frogs pump out lots of water from their cells into their extracellular space. They pump, uh, or they move, sorry, I keep on saying pump, but move glucose into their cells. That makes the, their cells the last thing to freeze. And also, um, if they do freeze, they freeze with very small ice crystals, less likely to do cell damage. And then when they thaw, the highest concentrations of glucose thaw first, and these are in organs like the heart. So the heart thaws first and pumps blood around um, to the rest of the frog. Um, I said water was a special case for facilitated diffusion, and they are. Uh, water moves through aquaporins, which is a channel uh, specifically for the movement of water through membranes. It's relatively recently discovered in the last, say, 30 years. Uh, and uh, these can be poisoned by mercury. These channels can be poisoned by mercury. And um, tissues that transport water routinely, like your tear ducts, the lining of your gut, uh, they have high concentrations of aquaporins. Here is top-down view of uh, aquaporin where uh, there's four subunits. Uh, water moves through the middle of each of those four subunits. And if you just look at one of these subunits, the monomer, the water molecule moves through a channel 
um, through the membrane. And if you think about this, this is a, it's a problem for water because water is water. It's hydrophilic. It likes itself, but it's moving through a hydrophobic environment, the acyl chains of the phospholipid uh, membrane. And so having a, a pore there that provides a hydrophobic channel through that hydro, sorry, a hydrophilic channel through a hydrophobic membrane makes sense. Um, active transport uh, is using uh, ATP to move things against the concentration gradient. And I am going to try, even though I failed twice on this podcast, that whenever I'm talking about a uh, active transport, I use the word pump. Whereas if I'm talking about facilitated transport, I use the word channel. So you can think of it this way. If you think of a channel, like the channels that are between the Portage Lakes in South Akron, um, they just move water from high to low. They're not, there's no pump involved there. They're just, uh, if the water is higher in la one lake and there's a channel connecting it to another lake, it moves from high to low until it becomes uh, at equilibrium. There's no energy except the, the gradient of water. Whereas a pump moves things from low to high. And this would be like if your house has a sump pump in your basement, which is broken through the concrete floor of your basement where water collects. And there's a pump that uses electricity to move water from its low concentration to usually outside your house. Uh, so it's moving it against gravity. That takes energy to do. And so these are electrified pumps, something that uh, your parents worry about in a storm is losing power and your sump pump fills up and there's no power to pump that water out during a storm. So uh, a pump moves things against the concentration gradient and uses ATP energy. A channel moves with the concentration gradient high to low and does not use ATP. Okay, here's a question for you, H5P. Um, if we look at simple diffusion through a membrane, you've seen this diagram uh, a bazillion times by now. If you have a semi-permeable membrane uh, and there are things that can or cannot go through that membrane, um, they will. if they can go through that membrane, they will equilibrate on both sides of that membrane just by simple diffusion. But if it's semi-permeable, in that it's permeable to water, but not permeable to these solutes, these little triangles in there, then water will move across the membrane and the solutes will not. And that's called mm -hmm. osmosis. So I think about osmosis in terms of the concentration of free water. So free water is water that is not busy binding to something else in the cell like these solute molecules. So in this diagram, on this side of the membrane, there's four solute molecules. And so there'll be many more free water molecules than over here where there's many more than four solute molecules. Each one of those solute molecules is going to have a water cage around it doing hydrogen bonding. And then that cage of water around each one of those solute molecules is not free to do whatever it wants. It is busy um, solubilizing that solute. And so there's less free water over here than there is here. If the free water here is high and the free water here is low, water moves from simple diffusion from high to low. So it moves from this side to this side over here. And that's why it looks like the water is going up on this side so that the, the concentration of free water is the same on this side than on this side. And the reason why it's a higher volume on this side is because there's more solutes occupied, uh, occupying the water on that side. So in terms of practically trying to answer these questions in terms of cells, it's 
it's easiest for me to think about it as the cell is sitting in a solution. So if you think of you yourself as a cell and the solution is the hot tub. So you as a cell, you're sitting in a hot tub, okay? And if the hot tub is a hypertonic solution, the water in the hyper, hot tub is a hypertonic solution, that means that the water in the hot tub, the solution you're sitting in, has less free water than you do sitting in the hot tub. And if you're sitting in a hypertonic solution, you will lose water to the solution because um, the there's less free water outside than inside you, and so you will lose water trying to equal that out. In a hypotonic solution, you're, sit, you're a cell and you're sitting in your hot tub, the water you're sitting in has more free water than is inside your cell, yourself as a cell, and so then water will come into the cell as a result of that. It's going from high to low, it's higher in the solution, in the hot tub, than it is in you, so it comes into you. And that causes cause cells to swell. And if it's not a uh, plant cell with a rigid cell wall, it can cause the cells to burst. In an isotonic solution, the rate at which water comes in and the rate at which water leaves is the same. So it's not that water doesn't leave or enter, it does. It's just for every, say, three water molecules that come in, on average, three water molecules go out. So if we look at a red blood cell and we plop that in a hot tub, uh, a little dish of hypertonic solution, a very salty solution, there would be less free water in that solution than there is in the cell, and the cell will lose water and it will shrink. If we plop that cell in a hypotonic solution, something like distilled water, has a very low ion concentration, inside that red blood cell there's ions in there. And so there's going to be less free water inside than outside. Water will come in trying to um, equilibrate uh, free water, and those cells can burst in that sense. And if you put it into an isotonic solution like isotonic saline solution, where the salt concentration inside the cell is the same as salt concentration outside the cell, then you won't see a change in the shape of that cell. You should be happy. Um, in a plant cell, uh, you would see the cell might shrink a little bit, but it it's, has a cell wall which is rigid. And most of the water is going to leave or enter this giant vacuole in the middle of plant cells. And so it's, it has this plasmalized uh, shape to it, where you can see the cytoplasm is contracted even though the cell is about the same size. Um, and in a plant cell that is in a, a hypotonic solution, the, that central vacuole is really full and pushing up against those cell walls, and so the plant is, uh, cell is very stiff. So you can do this experiment with celery, um, and they do this in the grocery store all the time. Part of why they missed the fresh uh, vegetables is that they want they, them to be Turgid. They want the water um, to be filling up those cells so it looks like it's very, very fresh. And uh, you can take wilted celery and stick it in um, tap water, which has low concentration of ions in it, and it will stiffen up. Um, and if you let that celery dry out, or if you put it in salty water, it'll, um, it'll bend over and become flaccid. Okay, um, looking at this uh, curve again, um, and let's say, let's try to answer this question. So you measure the rate at which a frog cell takes up glucose when exposed to cold temperature, and it looks like the green line. Because it looks like this, what else is true? So think about the shape of these curves, and then you should be able to answer this question. All right, um, almost all the books I have used talk about different types of transporters. They talk about uh, transporters channels, 
that use an ion gradient to either move things only in one direction, two things in one direction, or one thing in one direction, one thing in another direction. This is called a uniporter, a symporter, or an antiporter. I don't think it's super useful to know uh, these terms. Where it comes up is talking about a particular channel. So in if you're trying to acidify a vesicle, and we're going to talk about how, why that's important in receptor-mediated endocytosis. So you're trying to get a little membrane-bound compartment inside the cell to be at a lower pH than the rest of the cell. Well, you've got a little problem there because you can't just pump a bunch of hydrogen ions in there because then the charge uh, will start to repel um, new ions from coming in. You can solve that by at the same time pumping in a plus, you pump out a minus. Or you pump in, sorry, every, at the same time you pump in a plus, you also pump in a minus. In, um, and uh, if you do that, then you balance the charges and you can keep on adding hydrogen ions to the solution. And, and we would talk, in that case, we're going to talk about a specific uh, um, uh, channel that does that. Actually, that's a pump uh, that does that, uses ATP to do that. So what I'm trying to get at is, I don't care if you know these terms, uh, as I don't find them really useful. But I wanted to at least mention them because you're going to see them in lots of books. Okay. Um, in many types of channels, there is a clamshell sort of conformational change that does the facilitation. Um, the glucose is, in this case, is uh, binding to a binding site that is facing the outside of the cell. And then once it uh, binds, that induces a uh, conformational change in the protein. So now the clam is facing the inside of the cell. And then the, the glucose diffuses away. Once it's facing the inside of the cell without glucose bound to it, it reverts to its original shape. So that's one way you can get a big uh, hydrophilic molecule across the membrane is using this clamshell sort of conformational change. Okay, uh, another, uh, so that was an example of a channel. This is an example of a pump. It's likely that you've seen this pump talked about in other classes, but since we're be beginning the semester, just want to remind you of this. This is an antiporter. This is the sodium potassium ATPase. It's probably the most common user of ATP in all of your cells in your body. Like as much as half of all the ATP you use in a day uh, may go into this pump. And at the same time it's moving ions in one direction, it's moving other ions in another direction. So I'm just going to walk you through the different parts of this diagram. So we're going to start uh, with three sodium ions binding to the inside of the cell from a binding site that is created in what's called the E1 conformation when the sodium potassium ATPase is in the E1 conformation here. Then uh, sodium, uh, once it binds, will trigger autophosphorylation. So this is a phenomenon where the enzyme phosphorylates itself. That's why it's called autophosphorylation and it adds a uh, phosphate onto a particular residue, a particular amino acid, on the sodium potassium ATPase. Um, and then uh, the phosphate gets attached and ADP gets released. That causes a conformational change uh, from the E1 conformation down to E2. And in the E2 conformation, uh, the sodium is facing the outside of the cell and so and it diffuses away um, and at the same time 
uh, it creates a binding site for two potassiums from outside of the cell uh, that binds to the interior of this binding site, which is created by being in the two conformation. Okay, and then finally you release that phosphate that you added over here, and that causes the uh, sodium potassium ATPase to return to its E1 conformation. At the same time, it does that the sodium ions get pumped into the cell. So, uh, sorry, potassium ions get pumped into the cell. So potassium comes into the cell, sodium comes out of the cell, um, and both of those are against the concentration gradient. So sodium is normally high outside the cell, potassium is normally high inside the cell, and making it even higher by pumping more potassium in and more sodium out. Uh, and this is uh, the basis for action potentials in uh, neurons, for example. Um, and this is an example of an active transport pump. Okay, uh, I'll let you answer that by H5P.